we're going to get this started. Uh, I would like to welcome the one and only Dr. Wayne Frederick um, to the call. My name is Charlie Lewis. I am the president of the Howard University Alumni Association. I think, Dr. Frederick, this is the first time that we've been, that this has happened. Uh, so I am, you know, uh, excited about that and bringing all the good news to the alumni. Um, you, I say, are one of the most transparent uh, presidents that we've had in the history of Howard. I love that about you, uh, but I think we are going to, this year, we're going to do things a little differently and we're going to tell this story all throughout the year of all the wonderful things that we are doing at Howard University. So I want to welcome you to uh, the first alumni insight call uh, with your illustrious alumni. I appreciate it. Thanks for the invitation. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a really important uh, time for the university as well. And like you said, uh, my intention is to, you know, always be transparent, even honest. That is not always going to be popular, but uh, it's going to be the truth. <laughs> so I'm happy to do that. This is true. Um, also, too, this is for people out there, all the alumni out there, um, Dr. Frederick usually does a State of the Union address during homecoming, uh, which he will continue to do this year. But we felt that it is imperative that we get in front of you as the alumni to make sure that you guys understand exactly what's going on. I am in New York. Uh, <laughs> so um, with that being said, it is our, the, this, this call is really a call to action for the alumni to really get involved and really be a part of the university. We always tend to get around excited around homecoming, uh, but you know now it's time to stay informed because we believe if you stay informed and if you stay engaged, you will continue to support the alma mater and all the things with your times and your gift. And it is one thing that I wanted to do with my administration is to make sure that I get as many people many alum as possible involved in the Alumni Association. So therefore we could see the impact with engagement centered around fundraising as well as service, which is our motto. So um, let's start out the conversation with basically kind of giving us uh, incoming, a profile of this year's incoming class and where things stand with them. Yeah, you know, so the first thing is um, the semester obviously is unusual because of the pandemic and the majority of what we're doing is, is uh, set up on online. Our health sciences students are on campus um, as well as uh, we have some other pockets of students who are here, a few students with food and housing and security. And then what we decided to do with uh, the athletes who play winter sports so the men's and women's basketball teams and the women's volleyball team, uh, we offered the option to come to campus. And so they took that option. As a matter of fact, uh, our big time recruit is on a plane on his way here as we speak. Um, and so, you know, he's been on class online, McCormick, Maker, and he, uh, the night actually TNT is doing a HBCU special as they broadcast the games, but uh, he didn't want to miss another day end up being here so he refused to change his plate so a uh, good student and, and that's what we're going to see uh, we're testing those students uh, they, they some of them are living in the axis which is uh, for those of not, not to age anyone on the call but what used to be the Howard Inn and it's uh, over the bookstore uh, we've converted that back into an apartment uh, complex basically and so it's not a residence hall, so it's considered off campus as it will housing. And so we, we are housing the students in there. As a result, we're doing testing on a frequent basis. Uh, the students are being uh, tested in cohorts and as needed. Um, and right now we have a point, less than a 0.5% uh, positive test rate. Um, I think we have a total of four students who have tested positive over that period of time and have been appropriately quarantined, et cetera. While they're in quarantine, we deliver meals to them, uh, those types of things. That's working well. I actually visited the CLIA lab today uh, myself. Um, 
uh, in the hospital and I also went to get my weekly test. I'm being tested weekly just because of my activities. I'm coming in every day, been throughout the entire pandemic, still operating and going to the hospital. So uh, I'm, I fall into that category where I need to be tested frequently. Um, the, I would say, you know, the atmosphere, as you can imagine, is strange. Uh, not having people at the yard at NBC did an interview with me on the yard uh, yesterday at uh, nine o'clock and I was th- at eight o'clock, sorry. Right. And I was telling them, uh, you know, any other semester in the fall, we would not have been able to pull this off without, <laughs> right. you know, one folks being around. So it, it is a little different. Um, the fact that we have our own lab set up and we can do the testing, I feel good about. I think that's going to help us going forward, especially in the spring semester. Uh, so, you know, we'll see. But so far, so good. The, the students have been really good. Uh, no major outbreaks for those who are here. And the athletes in particular have been really focused. So I've been really, really impressed, as I was saying all along with our students. Okay. And how about faculty? Have, what's their... Uh, yeah, faculty are primarily coming in for research. Um, and same thing, they can get tested outside or, or with us. Um, they report in. Everybody has to report in when you come in. Uh, in the mornings, um, you answer a few questions to, to make sure that you don't, you know, have any reason to get a test or, or to be told not to come by until you're screened by a physician. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the faculty are doing that; they're accessing their labs uh, for research where uh, appropriate. And so far, that has been going well. Um, we are conducting a survey right now of students about the online learning. Uh, the preliminary data suggests that uh, very few technology issues. Uh, to date, and for the most part, students are really enjoying it. Uh, they feel that the quality is pretty good, uh, but like everything else, uh, they are missing the interaction face to face. And that uh, sometimes people ask me what the secret source is uh, at Howard, and the secret source is that ability to, you know, walk across the yard and meet everybody from, you know, as far away as Nigeria to. Uh, meet some kids from the Bronx and then run into somebody from LA and you know and you just can't you can't replace that online for whatever it's worth and so we, we're still uh, looking forward to that but other than that I think it's been going very well and the quality has been good so the faculty again as well have to be commended because they've really uh, stepped up and I want to say as well I, I say to the staff uh, there's a staff organization I meet with uh, once a month and I meet with their leadership as well once a month separately Mm-hmm. And I tell them all the time, they're the connective tissue at the end of the day. Uh, we're trying to keep the staff and uh, the, the faculty intact. We haven't taken any personal actions. I'm sure as you read the news, you'll see that many schools have laid off um, employees or furloughed or stopped uh, contributing to their 401ks or their 403bs and so on. And we haven't done that. Uh, we have uh, stayed the course. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it like that. Um, we're going to look at it every quarter and make an assessment. Uh, we don't want to contribute to the African American unemployment rate, uh, but it's going to be tight on the finances because we also recognize the hardship our students may have. And so we went ahead and gave them some hard grants. Uh, we gave those who get Pell grants uh, $500, those who get the maximum Pell grant, we give 1250 So we've really taken on a significant uh, financial burden uh, that's going to cost us about $8.1 million in revenue. That's a significant drop, that, but we're trying to manage the expenses without taking any action on the staff. Okay, okay. Is the staff on campus? Are they doing their jobs I'm, in the building, in the A building, and all of that? No, uh, only in essential employees. So, like, right now, um, I might be here by myself. Uh, they may have a security officer, and I think only the two of us are probably in this building right now. Uh, the fourth floor probably is the busiest. Uh, David Bennett, uh, VP for Development, has his office here. Paul Montero, Chief of Staff. Uh, Dr. Dubois, the EVP was in here today. Sometimes um, general counsel is in here. I'll say primarily the cabinet members are the ones who are in the A building. Everybody else is really working remotely uh, you know, and, and conducting the work. And we have some non-essential workers, quite frankly, who aren't doing anything and haven't done anything for the past six to eight months through no fault of theirs, Mm -hmm. uh, but they don't do work that could be done uh, remotely. But at the same time, like I said, we were making an effort to try to keep uh, the workforce um, intact and and so far so good. We've been managing the finances well enough to do that. 
That's great. That's great. So our incoming class, the profile of this class, I know it's one of the strongest class that we had and one of the largest classes that we've had. Uh, why don't you give us a little insight on that? Yeah. So, you know, this is, uh, this is a little unusual. We were trying to bring in a class of about 2000 to 2100. Uh, we have, uh, 2,543 freshmen wow. had this year by far, uh, the largest freshman class ever. Uh, the largest class prior to this was probably in the 2200. So significantly larger class. Um, they are just like all the other classes from all over the world, all over America. Um, as well. And the average um, SAT score is around 1200. Average GPA is about 3.6 to 37, somewhere in that range. And so once again, uh, we've attracted a really, really strong class. And I want to remind folks that this was pre-pandemic, right. pre, um, you know, social unrest and so on. I'm, I'm reading things where I see folks putting in things about HBCUs or benefiting from what has happened with George Floyd, et cetera. I remind everyone that, you know, students commit May 1st mm -hmm. and, and we were one of those schools that didn't uh, really move our deadline date, et cetera, because we just had so many students prior to May 1st. So a lot of this really is because of what we've been doing and pushing out and, and the information people have been seeing, the programs that we've laid out, et cetera. I, I do suspect uh, I, I, not, I shouldn't say I do suspect, I could tell you that as a result of everything else that's happening and how it's profile, especially uh, through the profile of our alum, as well as uh, what people are seeing in the news about us, um, I could tell you already that year over year, uh, we have already started the admission cycle for next year. And right. it's only September, <laughs> uh, really decision is due uh, November 1st. And I think those applications are up 56% already. So we are already heading in a very, very strong direction. I think, I, you know, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but easily we could probably have 25,000 applications for undergrad. And if we're admitting 2,000 to 2,500 students, you could do the math right there. Right. A lot of enrolling. So it's going to be, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a challenge. Um, as far as housing for the students next semester are, yeah, I know we were, you were in the process of redoing the quad, mm -hmm. getting that up and trying to get as many students on campus as possible uh, and having enough beds. Um, if we do go on camp on the, has there been a decision yet uh, yeah. about spring semester? And if we do go on campus, will we have enough housing basically at the current rate that we're going right now? Yeah, good question. You know, we have 5,300 beds. Uh, the other thing that's very unusual about Howard right now is that, and we've been, we, we've started this process four years ago. Um, so, you know, when I hear students complain about housing and housing crisis, it's, it's a little disheartening because that's just not the reality. 85% of the beds on this campus are five years or younger. Mm -hmm. so either they're brand new or they've been fully renovated recently. Right. I actually went over to the quad, uh, Two weeks ago, absolutely incredible. Uh, the facility is just absolutely fantastic. Um, there's a courtyard, well manicured lawn, places for the young ladies to sit. And I mean, it's just, a, it's really, really uh, has turned out uh, really well. So, you know, your short answer is uh, that if you, if you look at what we commit to doing, and what we commit to doing is giving housing for freshmen and sophomores. If we, if we enrolled another 2,500 next year, all of our housing would have to go to freshmen and sophomores. And that obviously is not uh, practical because you've got athletes that uh, we commit to house. You've got other people with other circumstances that are juniors and seniors, et cetera. The most important and critical thing about this though, Charlie, to understand is that when I started, when I took over, uh, our occupancy rate in our dorms was only about 88%. Okay. Right. And so financially that wasn't helpful. Uh, we didn't have attractive housing. Nobody wanted to stay with us. People would sign up to stay with us. We'd have, you know, overflow. We'd be 110% subscribed. Mm -hmm. And then people would do the okie dokie on us uh, the first week of school and us show up and sure enough, we'd end up with 88%. So now that everything is renovated and brand new, and everything else around here is more expensive. Everybody wants to stay with us. 
Right. And so the housing crisis that people sometimes talk about is just because we have high demand. Uh, we have excellent housing on campus and it's obviously significantly less expensive than elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so the question now is, do we continue to expand that? And that is in our campus master plan. We're hoping two to three years from now to be able to put a building uh, on Sherman Avenue uh, where we own property. Uh, we're going to renovate um, Effingham and the Manor. For those of you who aren't as familiar with that, those are the buildings on Georgia and alongside the Burgeon. Right. Uh, we're in the process of, of renovating those with a developer. Um, what we're going to do is to put in for first right of refusal on a certain number of beds there as well. Okay. Uh, the issue, we, we are going to expand our housing. Um, I, you know, I told you about the freshman class. Um, the other thing that has happened that hasn't happened in a while is our continuing class is also significantly higher than ever before. So our enrollment last fall was 9,400. Mm -hmm. Enrollment as of today is 10,900. So wow. we had a 15% increase in enrollment. If that trend continues, we could end up easily with 11,000 to 12,000 students next year. Mm -hmm. If we end up in that, you know, in that group, we would only have housing for 5,300 beds. So we would certainly have to expand that. So we are actively looking at what those opportunities are. And we're going to be talking to the board about potentially trying to bring about those buildings sooner rather than later. But again, uh, in the middle of a pandemic with the financial circumstances we have, we, we're not going to be able to go build two, three buildings um, and add a thousand beds uh, to, to Howard's inventory over the course of uh, the next six months. Uh, some of the, uh, residence halls that were in disrepair that we did real estate deals with as well. We also are talking to some of those folks as well. So the places such as uh, Carver, uh, which is now a nice uh, apartment complex and slow. Uh, we're also looking to try to secure beds uh, for students in those facilities as well. And so that's going to be our strategy over the next uh, couple of years until you know we can stand up brand new facilities or um, exercise the options of buying back those buildings as well. And again, we, we never sell the land. Um, the developers put all the money in to uh, renovate those buildings. And uh, so we, we do have clauses in there where we can go back and actually take the buildings back. And I'm glad you brought that up because clearing that up for the alum, a lot of people, first thing you always hear is Howard is selling everything. So how it's so Meridian, how it's so Carver, how it's so slow. So tell us and walk us through and just clarify it for the people out there to make it make sense of what, how we are approaching all of our real estate deals so, since you've been in office. Yeah, so you know, real estate I saw as an opportunity. Uh, the neighborhood around us was changing significantly and um, we did not have revenue coming in. Uh, I inherited a hospital that lost, was losing $60 million in the year that I started. Um, we had a tuition that was probably 40% of our competitors in the city. Mm -hmm. um, we charged less than Spelman College and Morehouse College. Mm -hmm. And with all due respect, not, not taking anything away from them, uh, this is our one university. We charge less tuition and, and fees than those two institutions. And so when I looked at that, we, and we had a, an alumni giving rate of just of over 4%. So we were raising eight to $10 million a year. The hospital was losing $60 million a year. And we were charging, uh, you know, 60% less. None of that adds up. And we also were admitting a Pell Grant base of almost 50%. So we were also admitting students who, who weren't writing us checks. So when you put all that together, that's, that's not a financial circumstance that we would be winning. So I looked at how could we diversify the revenue stream until we could fix all those things and get in a better financial circumstance. And that was the strategy around real estate. And so what we did with real estate is we went out and got developers who could do long-term leases um, for the land, take over the buildings, renovate them. Obviously, they would then become a revenue stream and then what we basically asked for was all of the lease money up front. And then we then took that lease money and put it into the buildings on campus. So the quad got renovated as a result of the Meridian deal. Uh, the money 
uh, uh, from um, Meridian has also helped and from uh, the deals like with Carver and Slow also helped to uh, renovate the undergrad library, which by the way, I went into last week. Absolutely incredible. Um, uh, you know, I think that's one of that was one of my favorite places when I was a freshman here and walking back in there and seeing what it looks like a modern day library on a on a campus glass um, everywhere. I mean, just looked absolutely fantastic. And of course, a modern day library is a much louder place and it just has the right feel. It's going to have a little uh, snack shop in there as well. There's going to be a space where you can sit and kind of eat cafe style. Oh. Instead of having to run all the way back over to the cafeteria, especially in the dead of winter. Right. So just absolutely fantastic. Great study rooms, um, flat screen TVs for folks to do their work. So again, I encourage alum uh, when they come to visit that that will be up uh, in January. So the, the point is the money that we generated from those deals we put into fixing campus because we had no other revenue stream to do that. And rather than sit around and wait, um, you know, we decided to do that. Now, again, while people are, were, were imp, impatient and complaining about the state of the facilities, I was very transparent and open in every single meeting that this is what we were going to do. Uh, and, and it is going to take time. And some of those students uh, who were in those dorms in 2016 or, or in some of these facilities in 2016, they're not going to benefit from that. Blackburn is being renovated as well, another full renovation. And that'll be available next year as well. Uh, and then we're going to start the Douglas Hall renovation. But a lot of what we've been able to do with the physical facility, which still isn't enough, really primarily, that's where we got the funds from to do it. And so that's been the strategy. Uh, okay. What we have done in some of the more recent deals is also added a revenue component, an equity component for us, so we can generate a revenue stream. And we've continued to add components, especially where there's housing involved, even if it's apartment or condo, that we want some right of first refusal on a specific amount um, of the units so that we can actually um, put our students in there if we need, or even go back and, and buy the building at certain terms, buy the building back in, in that period of time. So, it, I mean, it, 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 get, it got uh, property that was really running, you know, being run down and in very poor condition, mm -hmm. um, back up and revitalized without us having to put out funds. And it also generated funds for us to then go uh, fix, you know, things on campus that were in desperate need uh, of repair. Okay, that sounds good. That's a lot of information, and I'm glad you stated that. Um, I think one one thing also too, um, when alumni think about Howard, they only think about their particular school or college that they graduated from. And I always try to remind people that Howard is 13 schools and colleges, and about to be 14 schools and colleges. In addition to, you have the hospital and you have two other campuses. So and a radio station and a TV station and 19 Division One sports so we could keep going. <laughs> there you go. So you got really 20 different business entities, which is a budget of what? Almost a billion dollars now? Is so it? About eight, yeah, th this year actually was one of the highest we've ever had, almost 870 million uh, rev on the revenue side and expense, obviously less than that, but mm -hmm. yep, it's approaching that. Right. So that's why I said, you know, so when we get these gifts, I think, I, you know, I want people to see the bigger picture here of what it takes to run Howard University. It is a special place, but it's a lot of components. Uh, that being said, we had some really great news and it seemed like we are staying in the news and I love it. It's all positive. Uh, but earlier this week, we were ranked number 80 in U.S. News and World Report. Uh, and that jump was from 104, so that was 24 jumps. So kudos to you to making that happen. What goes into that ranking in order for us to get to that point? And also being, you know, the number two HBCU and the number 29 private institution, and we can go on and on and on breaking that down. But I really want you to explain to the alumni some of the cause and effects that matter uh, when you are making decisions as a president of a university that takes us to that point? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, a couple, first let me start off by saying I am absolutely against <laughs> the ranking system. And that's primarily because the components of it, in my opinion, 
skew it to certain institutions. So for instance, 25% of the points that go into the ranking is peer assessment. So that simply means to me that if, and I get the form as a, as a university president, I get the same form that the other almost 3000 university presidents get. And in the national university category, you probably have anywhere from 500 to 1000 universities. When I get that form, 90% of those institutions, I have no clue about them. And I'm not going to sit there and go look at every single one. So one of the things that I sometimes hear people say about me is, you know, I don't want Howard uh, getting any negative press. I don't. I, and I, I'm, I'm not ashamed of that. Right. Uh, as a triple alum, I don't. Especially if it's not over stuff that's accurate, true, or a story well told because people are not going to always give us that that freedom. So when and and when when you think of the U.S. News and World Report, somebody who hears about Howard in a negative fashion, then when they get to Howard, they're just going to assume everything else. They're not going to look up who Howard's alum are, what Howard has done. They're not going to do that. On the same token, when you have good news, that's what they're going to do. This ranking, actually, again, just to be clear, uh, that form gets filled out in March. So nothing that has happened in the past four or five months really influenced that. And the data they use is from the year before as well. So what are the components? Um, student outcomes uh, is a major component. And so when we were ranked 145, the year that I took over, I went to the board and I said, listen, I think we can move this, but I want to do an analysis of it. I brought US News and World Report in. And what we discovered is that most schools only move an average of two spots per year, up or down on average. Yes, every now and then somebody will have a big jump like we've had, but they, they generally move in that range. And so I said to the board, I think we could move five spots a year. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you go back and you track it from 145, my goal was to get us to 120 at this point. Okay. And if you go back and you look at where we've traditionally been ranked and so on, I think if we got into the one teens, everybody would have been pleased with that. What I then discovered is that if I really focus on student outcomes, because a part of it is financial resources, mm -hmm. um, we're never going to win that game. A part of it, because they look at faculty salaries, et cetera. And if you look at, you know, kind of what faculty gets paid and, and how much money you put into the physical plant, I mean, they look at those types of things. We're not going to win those games. But I, there are two areas in particular I felt that we could win on. One was the quality of the students we brought in. I felt we could change that significantly. The second was the quality of the graduation rate. How good were you doing at that? And I felt that we were poor at that. Our four-year graduation rate when I took over was 38%. Yeah. And so I felt we could put some things in place there. Our alumni giving rate is another factor that I thought that we should really try to engage around. And then on the faculty salaries, I felt we could raise the faculty salaries, but the other financial things, like in terms of every time you put up a new building, et cetera, they have a very complex scoring system, you know, to give you those things, I felt it would take time for us to get there. So that's what we did. We, we stood up the Office of Undergraduate Studies. Uh, we made sure that students were taking at least 15 credits a semester. We bought purchased software so that students could really track what um, they were doing in terms of classes. If they were taking something they should not take for their major, we flagged that. Mm -hmm. uh, we put all these interventions in. So what has happened? Uh, four-year graduation rate is up 20 percentage points. Wow. Uh, we are on the verge of having a four-year graduation rate above 60%. That's and amazing. if you go and research, uh, especially for Black students in America, they're, they're in four-year colleges, their graduation rate is around 20, 21%. We're going to get to three times what the national average is for black students in universities. Is, is there a difference between PWIs and HBCUs in the graduation rates? And, and there's a difference. It's hard to discern what that difference is, depending on who it is, because obviously the schools in the top 20, they want to protect their graduation rate. So they make sure when they get black students that they get them over that finish line. Okay. But if, if you look at major state institutions and so on, the graduation rate is, is almost no better. And HBCUs, as we know, uh, do a much better job of graduating African-American students. And that's, so that's still the case. We, we also um, really went out across the country to try to engage alum about giving, try to communicate more about what's, what's going on, et cetera. And that um, alumni giving rate is now up to 12%. 
it's still a third of uh, you know Spelman, Morehouse, Claflin. It's actually a quarter of, of Claflin's, and so that does going go into uh, the score, and that's something that we need to get up for more reasons than just the ranking. Like I said, I'm not crazy about the rankings, but it does bring you a different kind of attention. And so we really focus on those things, and what you're seeing now is a change. The other interesting thing is we I double down on trying to support Pell Grant students. So we started a Grace Grant. If your expected family contribution was zero, we filled up the rest of your financially with institutional aid, which really is just a discount. So instead of charging you 25,000, mm -hmm. we were charging you zero, basically because you got a Pell Grant, uh, which we applied to tuition and then we filled it basically with a discount. Uh, that was a, what I like to call an unfunded mandate. What that resulted in though, um, we've now had a, a four or five year experience of doing that. The students who got that Grace Grant, their graduation rate, Pell Grant students, expected family contribution of zero mm. is 91% at Howard University. Wow, that's amazing. Students who didn't get that, their graduation, four year graduation rate is 61%. So we still do a good job with Pell Grant students, but with students that we give that Grace Grant, it helps. And so what you're seeing now is the US News and World Report, and actually two years ago, Senator Harris and a couple other senators wrote the US News and World Report editor saying, listen, you've got to do a better job of leveling the playing field if people are going to be looking at these rankings and really push for some changes uh, to, to, to look at that. So they started looking at the Pell Grant graduation rate. We're always going to win on that um, notion. So the year before, we went to 89. And as soon as people saw that Pell Grant graduation rate was going to be a focus, the next year, we went back to 104 primarily because everybody else started playing the game. But before we got to 89, we were 110. So we still moved up. I mean, 104 was a more reasonable move, so to say. This year, uh, they added student indebtedness. And again, contrary to what is said sometimes uh, about students talking about on, uh, you know, that we've hiked tuition and so on, student indebtedness has actually gone down every year for the past five years at Howard. And so since they added student indebtedness as one of the markers on the US News and World Report, that also resulted in lifting us. But then the big gifts, like a Mackenzie Scott gift, we, we are applying some of that money to the Grace Grant students, because like I said, it was an unfunded mandate. And so those are the things that attract donors that because they see that even without our, without resources, we, we're very committed to low income students. And those are the types of things that ultimately result in, in us rising in the rankings. And, I, and I, I think this one is going to be sticky, meaning that we're going to stay around here, but we have to be cognizant that the air now is getting a lot more rare. As you pointed out, we're ranked 29th among all private universities in the country. Right. Uh, and so that's very high. And the next HBCU, which I'll leave unnamed in national university ranking is 217, if you want a comparison. Yeah, that's a that's a good little <laughs> tug on the, the HU real -ness. Uh Speaking of our recent gifts, um, we've had quite a few recently. Um, you mentioned the McKenzie Scott uh, gift, uh, which was thirty two point eight million to support. I mean, excuse me, that was Bloomberg. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, Forty million <laughs> from McKenzie Scott. Uh, which was really nice. And that was a good thing. We have enough gifts that you can mix them up. So that's, that's a good thing. That's a good thing, right? <laughs> so McKenzie Scott, 40 million, unrestricted gift. Talk to, diff talk to us about the difference between a restricted gift and an unrestricted gift. And what does that mean for you? Yeah, good point. You know, um, and again, I, I think this is a very important point. Uh, that gift could be used for anything. Mm -hmm. I said to the donor, can I just go raise salaries for everybody. She said, if that's what you think is the best way to spend it, then that's what you do because we trust what you're doing. It is a significant level of confidence in the institution about what we're doing and what we're trying to do for somebody to give you a $40 million unrestricted gift. Just think about, you know, and, and I'm not going to use anybody else as an example except myself. My wife and I have made a pleasure how it is and so we give uh, a five-figure gift every year. And I think of 
that donor agreement that's written up on that five figure gift. <laughs> and I'm embarrassed because, right. you know, my mom was a nurse. I, uh, so one of the scholarships that we have, I, I want uh, it to go to a student who demonstrates interprofessional education in the best way possible. So my mom always used to say that, you know, as a physician, you want to be respectful of all the other healthcare providers and work with them well. And so we give a scholarship to a student who does that well. Right. Very. So it's very clear. Right. Yeah. Nobody can take that money and go give it to just anyone. This mm -hmm. gift I can use in any way, shape or form that I want. And so we've decided on five things that we're going to use it for. One is for the Grace Grant. We, we're going to put uh, start a, a kind of a, an, a fund uh, to support faculty raises. Again, this is probably not going to happen in my time, but if we put away that money and we allow it to gain interest, somebody 15, 20 years from now, who's a president is going to have a pot of money every year that they can apply for faculty salary raises. And for us to retain the best faculty, we're going to have to do that. We employ more African-American faculty than anybody else. And I'd love to see us stay uh, that way. Uh, infrastructure, some of the rundown on the steam plant and the other the deterioration in those buildings, uh, we need a building fund. And so I think this is an opportunity to start putting that away. We want world-class facilities because we have world-class faculty and students and we, we, we need to be doing that. Um, we're trying to invest in a social innovation hub. Um, I want to put so, you know, social entrepreneurship at the core of that activity. And I think that the humanities and uh, social sciences needs to wrap around that. And what we want young people to do who are going into those fields is to look at the opportunity to become an entrepreneur and still solve the big problems uh, of the day. And so we're going to put uh, some funds into that. And so that's how we're going to use it. But when you get an unrestricted gift like that, it really gives you a lot more uh, latitude to do what you think is necessary. And it also, like I said, is a, is a significant endorsement uh, that people are confident uh, that you know what you're doing. Right. Um, and then moving from there, we had Bloomberg give $32.8 million um, to the med school, to the College of Medicine, which definitely was a game changer because it basically took care of the incoming medical students and the current medical students, their tuition. So how did that affect you and the way you use money right now with the hospital? Yeah, it, yeah again, significant gift, you know, and when we got that call, uh, that call was about how can, he has a Greenwood initiative how can we create intergenerational wealth? And so the, the great thing about that is they, they allowed us to kind of get engaged with them and discuss how, how best to do it, right? And, I, and obviously lowering student debt, uh, I felt was, was something to do. Now the gift is structured a little different to mm -hmm. the, the gift instance uh, that occurred at Robert Smith at, at Morehouse. And um, it's, whereas that gift goes directly to the students, uh, who graduated to pay off their debt, what we did with this gift is we uh, suggested that it could be applied to tuition of the current students mm -hmm. and for like the seniors up to 100,000 of any debt they accrued while paying our tuition. Right. And so that means that that is revenue that's going to come into the institution mm -hmm. and, and we also have an administrative fee for wraparound services. I think that, you know, Bloomberg Philanthropies, I can't give them enough credit. They were very thoughtful um, about how they do that because we, it's one thing for you to have less debt. It's another thing that, you know, whether or not you are supported well enough to be successful as a student. And so I, I think we negotiated a really good deal. Uh, and again, it's about relationship building. Um, this is, it's a big investment mm -hmm. in my opinion, um, from, uh, Mr. Bloomberg and Bloomberg philanthropies, but it's about relationships. So today, he has an initiative where he uh, has mayors from all around the world um, on a call. I, I believe it occurs as often as weekly. Mm -hmm. And he had me kind of as the opening speaker. And, and so you'll see a press release about it tomorrow. So again, it was an incredible platform right. uh, to have to talk about the great works of Granite Howard. And he just wanted me to provide an inspirational message uh, to all of these mayors all around the world. And, and so it's a, it's a very good opportunity for us to build relationships, for us to uh, bring uh, issues to the forefront as well. And it's not lost in me uh, what Mayor Bloomberg's uh, history has been, good and bad. I, I think we have to look at what he has said 
and done recently. And also, I think it's an opportunity for us to bring uh, opportunities to him uh, to see that. And so it's an amazing gift. It is a very thoughtful gift. It's a forward-looking gift. Mm -hmm. And if you look at NYU Langone mm -hmm. College of Medicine and that gift there, from the time I saw that gift, I made it clear that that's the kind of gift at a Howard University that transforms uh, healthcare for black people in America. Right, and what a great time basically during COVID and how we are impacting in our community and you guys have been definitely on the front line there in DC working with that. We also got a $10 million gift this year also uh, with STEM, uh, which what's the Kirsch uh, uh, gift. The Kirsch STEM scholars gift, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's great in itself. So this year so far, where are we number wise um, with uh, incoming gifts? <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to keep track and <laughs> David obviously uh, kind of is the bean counter here. But so I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, what, let me put it in context. The fiscal year ends June 30th. So at the end of June last year, we had raised over $30 million for the first time in any single year. Uh, and university's history. And I'm not saying $30 million in pledges. Or, I mean, cash, a significant cash against that came in every year. I, I mean, every, every month uh, and on closing every one of those gifts. Um, since July 1 uh, to now, we have closed on in excess of, uh, I think at this point, uh, we're nearing 80 to 84 million. And we have you know, a significant number of gifts in the hopper. So we'll see, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic um, that we could easily be the first HBCU to raise well over a hundred million dollars, uh, probably in half of the year. All right. We'll see, but we're pushing and uh, it's heading in the right direction. And, you know, we, we feel that we're well on our way. Uh, we have big grants as well that have come in. Uh, I think I put out an announcement today about uh, the quantum computing grant from IBM, where we're going to be the lead uh, center. And, you know, those types of grants and research, again, because of what the faculty is doing, young faculty members in physics like Thomas Sewell's, uh, is exactly, again, the type of activity we need to be involved in. Right, right. And that was major in itself. As the lead, what kind of pressures does that put on you? I mean, because right now we're leading in Google West. Uh, we started the other campus. Uh, I mean, we started the partnership with Amazon Studios. Uh, why don't you briefly give us an update on where those two things, because that was innovative in itself. And then also, too, if you have any other innovative strategies or, you know, outside of real estate that we're looking at to improve our finances, I want you to touch upon that as well. Yeah, sure. So Howard West is uh, going well. Uh, Google, again, was very gracious. They took care of our students really well uh, during the shutdown, uh, flew them back home when they could. Um, but for the first part of the shutdown, they kept them there safe and, and continued to teach them, converted to online as we did here. I mean, just really did a fantastic job. And so we've been very pleased. As you know, we've expanded that opportunity to other HBCUs and Hispanic serving institutions. And so it has grown very nicely and, and continues to be, a, you know, again, a, a model um, venture. Uh, Howard Entertainment, Amazon Studios, this was the first year. And again, they did absolutely fantastic. You know, um, it, with the same shutdown and all of that, they, they recrafted the circumstances. Part of that uh, program is an internship in the summer. They, they went ahead and had the students do that. I think the first part of it was virtual and then whatever limited engagement they could have with them, they're gonna continue. And uh, we, we've just um, verbally re-opted with them uh, for, the, for this year. And so we, we're gonna send the students out again, uh, if appropriate, but in the interim, they're doing some things virtually. Uh, we are out and about, uh, Charlie, to be quite honest with you, trying to really expand the reach and to use that, my, my vision around workforce development in a different way. Like I've always said, I want students to continue to be gaining credits and matriculating while having these experiences. And I also want them to be getting paid because of their um, income status. And I want these companies to support uh, by, you know, giving us significant money to cover their tuition. Correct. That's what we're doing. So we, we have several other 
uh, things that we're looking at right now that we, you know, people we're talking to, we're looking at a Howard Sports uh, activity that could involve the NBA and the NFL. We've started some conversations there, and I think that there's some opportunity there. We, we're looking for a symbiotic relationship. I'd love to see the African American athletes in particular be able to enroll at Howard and get certificate uh, at all the way to degrees. And so we've started some engagement and conversations there that we're really uh, happy about, as well as I want to see my students in the C-suites. Right. Uh, so we're trying to start programs. I want to see them, you know, running uh, those, those, uh, those teams and, and really looking after uh, Black athletes and, again, creating uh, intergenerational wealth. So we're, we're looking at that. In terms of the finances, um, you know, we've been active on that front as well. Uh, I went back and I looked at all our debt. Our debt um, burden is not very large, to be quite honest. But I felt that we should, because of the low interest rates and how long it's been um, low and for the foreseeable future, I felt that we should go back and look at some of the bonds that had been taken out prior to my tenure. So we had a 2008 series, a 2011 series. And uh, those deals had some huge balloon payments beginning in 2022 uh, and so on, where, you know, in some years we, we would be paying back 25 million a pop on that. And so that was not something that I could, I, I felt would be in the university's best interest. Again, not onerous that, but I just felt that there might be an opportunity there. So that's what we did. We went back and we uh, went back to market. Uh, people have seen our financial results. They've seen a hospital that's turned around with a positive bottom line for the past three years. They've seen us trying to grow enrollment wisely. They've seen the different things that we've done. And uh, we got a really good outcome. Um, every, uh, the two series that we uh, went back and refinanced um, got, were oversubscribed. And as a result, our debt payments um, over the course of the life of those bonds, which in some cases is two or three decades, uh, probably saved the university another 60 something, almost $70 million. Um, we front loaded that. So most of uh, the savings for it will occur in the next five years. And, that, and those savings, uh, I believe, add up to almost 40 something million. So the other thing about the refinancing is rather than paying out an extra five million a year for the next five to eight years, we can use that cash for something else. Right. And, and so that's kind of some of the financial um, machinations that we've been undergoing uh, to again, keep the university healthy. And I think that that also is gonna help us uh, when you look at credit ratings and those types of things as well, people are gonna see some of those moves favorably, which means that if we can improve our credit rating, we can then go out to market uh, to get uh, new money uh, for new buildings as well. So that's, that's part of a, a broader strategy right. uh, for us to go after. And that also has helped um, with the amount of cash we have on hand as well. We've also had the highest amount of cash on hand uh, that, than we've ever had. Again, we still have storms ahead. So I, I don't want us to get comfortable. It's not over. And the way a university like Howard runs, um, great finances today uh, doesn't mean uh, great finances tomorrow. Uh, right. Because as the African-American community gets hurt by a recession and by a pandemic, uh, the ability for students to pay to come here actually decreases. Right. And so we've got to be thoughtful about that as well. We still got to go out and, and um, really renovate this entire campus over the next decade, replace buildings, et cetera. That still is going to require cash. We have to be raising money uh, significantly. And so we, we're still out doing that. Uh, we're going to be putting out a series of announcements over at least the next seven to eight weeks okay. about um, seven figure gifts that, that we've closed on. So all of that stuff uh, still needs to continue happening well into uh, the next decade. Yeah, sounds good. And I love that. Um, from a financial standpoint, we have always uh, relied on the appropriation bill, um, the appropriations from the government. Um, where do we stand with that now? And how do we wean ourselves off of that? <laughs> yeah, the appropriation is uh, now under 30% of our revenue. And, you know, we're going to continue to expand the other aspects of our revenue. This year, because of our fundraising, might be the first year 
in quite some time that it drops to probably 20% of our revenue base, which is going to be very unusual. Um, if, if it drops to that amount, uh, to somewhere between 20 and 25%, it's heading in the right direction. And, and that's the direction that we want. We don't want to be overly reliant on that. Now, my strategy, again, in the short term has been to try to expand that, to make the argument that the return on investment that the country has been getting is fantastic. And so that's what we did. When I started, we were around $219 million a year, and that is now up to 240 something And we're working, uh, you know, it doesn't look promising that a, a, a budget will pass. Um, hopefully, there will be no government shutdown. Uh, but even in a continuing resolution, we don't necessarily get um, all uh, that we expect to get. And so it's an unreliable uh, source of revenue in the sense of timing. So over the course of a year, we may get the full amount of the appropriation, but it doesn't come every quarter depending on the machinations of the government. So the larger percentage of the uh, revenue pie that it represents, the more harm it is for us if we don't get that cash in a timely fashion. And so we, we, the less reliable, we, the less dependable we are on it, the better. At the same time, being the only federally chartered HBCU, I do feel strongly that we need to continue to position ourselves that it is for the overall benefit of the country, uh, that it continues and that it's robust uh, to fund all of the activities that we wanted to fund. And so we, we're still going to be making that argument and uh, making sure that we're well positioned to you know, continue to expand it in the short term, but we have to continue to expand everything else that we're doing long term. Okay. We have about eight minutes left. Uh, I want to get to the heart of our call to action, which is our alumni, which is the asset of our university. Um, we have over 86,000 alum, 80,000, the number keeps changing, um, that's out there. And I really want to talk about uh, giving and why alumni giving matters. Um, as you stated, there's we our current rate is 12%. When you started, it was 4%. But we know that uh, now, and how it is in the news, and I think we have to be creative and we have to think about different ways of creating funds as the alumni themselves. And that's something that we've been charged to do, HUAA, that is, um, which is how do we move that needle? And under my administration, I definitely want to come back with, you know, a game plan that help us move that needle. But I want you to, to you know, give us your, your insight because you're there every day. You're talking to corporations, uh, partners uh, and everything. You're, with, you're meeting with the board. Why does alumni giving matters matter um, to, you, to, to Howard University? Yeah, you know, so I, I, I think if you I think if you look at um, the gifts that we've had, as an example, one of the questions that always comes up is what is alumni giving, and what then happens in that discussion is that's a measure, it's a litmus test for whether or not people really appreciated the education that they got, and do they have confidence in the institution and love for it enough to give of their own money. I mean, for somebody to take $40 million who's never gone to Howard and gotten a degree to Howard and then learn that the people who actually got degrees, um, you know, only 12% of them give is risky, right? I mean, I know if I had $40 million to give and I decided to go give it to an institution that I just thought was special and I didn't know anything else about them, I would use the same litmus test. I think we all would. And so it's critical that we do that. Every administration of HUA basically asks me the same question. What can we do? And I say the same thing every single time. The primary thing that the Alumni Association can and has to do, in my opinion, is to make sure that there is significant engagement uh, by the alum so that people have facts, they participate in things like this, they get the real story, they don't uh, you know, send me emails or call you up or call me up with myths, as I shared with you before, <laughs> some of the types of myths that people yeah. share, but they get the real, they get the, the actual story and that they promote the university in the best way possible and give. Right. You have to give to the university to support 
what is happening because it's a different conversation if I walk in the room and say, yeah, among the HBCUs, we get the biggest support from our alum. Claflin says that now because 51% of the alum give. This year was remarkable. Mm -hmm. This year was absolutely remarkable. We had 1,400 undergrad alum who have never given to the university before give to the university. And when I say this year, this is through June 30th. Right. An absolute record. And when you think that we have a base of undergrad alum of about 54,000 of that 80,000 you mentioned, about 54,000 uh, um, undergrad, it's an incredible number. And, and it's, it's a number for us to sit back and think that, yes, if that's what we're doing in terms of adding people to the rules, that's great. But remember that alumni giving rate is something we calculate every year. So you can't give now and then give again in 2025. We want you giving every single year and being supportive of the university. And like I said, uh, having the alum engaged is the thing. So my charge uh, is just quite simply those two things. Come and get the truth. Our motto is truth and service. Let's not uh, spread rumors and innuendos. Let's just ask the questions straight up. I'll tell you the good and the bad mm -hmm. and the ugly. Um, and also, let's be sure to make sure that we're giving and we're encouraging our fellow alum to give as well. Okay. All right. And I received that. We received that. And we will be bringing you some, some good little... Uh, uh, new ideas and fresh ideas uh, along to, you know, get the alumni involved and ready. And they are ready. Uh, and we are going into the next 30 days. We just kicked off, I know the Department of Alumni Relations just kicked off a Bison funder for a 30-day campaign between starting yesterday, going into homecoming um, for that to start, uh, uh, start that process. Uh, but also this Friday, we have another special tomorrow, that is, with Apple. Um, kind of, it's almost kind of a kickoff to uh, the fall season. Uh, how did that all come about with uh, Apple Music and the concert that was done at Howard University on the football field and in Bird Gymnasium and the like? Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that I think uh, we, we're getting a reputation um, of in terms of especially dealing with corporations and, and large donors is our ability to do our business confidentially. Uh, no leaks, no drama, um, be supportive, et cetera. And so, you know, Apple approached us, uh, given some of the things that were happening in March in Washington, et cetera, they wanted to put on a special. And so uh, they approached us. They thought it would be great to shoot from a university campus uh, and, uh, an HBCU and they felt that Howard was the right HBCU to do that. And so we accommodated them. Uh, they brought entertainers in, they had really strict protocols. Uh, and we were very clear about that, that if we were gonna do anything like this, anybody who came on campus really had to uh, follow the guidelines for the city, et cetera. So all of those things were done in an appropriate fashion. And so uh, they put on a concert. Um, there are other things that come with it that we'll get an opportunity to announce uh, hopefully in a week or, or two. And uh, it was well done. And I, again, kudos to, you know, David Bennett and Andrew Rivers, their events team. Uh, they managed it really, really well. Um, I didn't get to see any of the artists or hear any of them uh, live. Uh, we, we all obeyed all the rules and had them do it. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing it. I think it's going to be great. And I think uh, because of all of the places that they, they shot, it, it's going to be basically a free um, advertisement of everything Howard in terms of uh, what you get for being physically on this campus. So it was a, you know, I think it's going to be a nice touch. And Apple, uh, you know, is becoming a really good partner uh, to us as well. So I want to give them uh, kudos as well for the things that they've been trying to do to raise awareness and uh, to bring about change, you know, and I think uh, this is going to have that kind of a theme. And I, I also think the other things that we'll be able to announce, uh, hopefully in a week or two, will also demonstrate um, w when people come to us what we are emphasizing and where we're, we want folks to put, uh, you know, put their weight behind the types of things that we think are important and, and making sure that people are sticking to our principles. 
Right, right. And that's, that's one thing. I think, you know, um, we have a lot of people asking because how it is in the news because of a myriad of reasons, you know, uh, and all the good things that are coming to us. How are we cultivating these relationships and partnerships and making sure that we, that we benefit, number one, but also, too, that they, they trickle down from either alumni to the students to faculty, whatever the case may be, how are we cultivating those relationships to make sure that they stick and that they still, you know, hey, Bloomberg, we would love to him to have another gift next year. Mackenzie Scott, you know, let's have another Mackenzie Scott gift. What are we doing on our end to make sure that we are, you know, cultivating these relationships? You know, I, uh, I think that's a critical part of it. When I started, I felt we needed a, a an office for corporate relations for corporate relations and we now have that uh debbie jarvis heads that up and but that was part of the reason for setting that up because i felt uh w while david bennett and development and alumni relations are raising money and managing situation with alum we need somebody blocking and tackling every day around those relationships you know talking to folks about um why they should be engaged with us so even if they are engaged with us how we can enhance that relationship to your point. And so that's a lot of what they do, that relationship mapping, uh, that, that relationship management, uh, keeping folks engaged, sending them information when we have news about what we're doing, et cetera. So you could imagine, for instance, our ranking, all of those types of things, you know, having conversations, bringing people back to the table to have a conversation about how they could re-up on their investment. Um, and it's not just about giving money, it's about internship, uh, internships, as you said. Uh, right now, we're working on a couple of things, for instance, because there are several people who have approached me recently um, about alum, hiring our alum, uh, people who may be mid-career mm -hmm. and, and what that looks like. And so trying to set up a database and a system where alum can give us the information and then we could push that information out to certain employers and also enhance, again, uh, the, the Howard brand and the Howard footprint out in the corporate world, we think is critical as well. And so... All of those are the types of things that uh, the corporate relations office is helping with career stuff and working hand in hand with development to make sure that there's seamless transitions back and forth about all, with all of these relationships. Okay, okay. And just because we're at the top of the hour, um, I know a lot of people want to know about homecoming, what's planned this yeah. year. Uh, it's going to be a virtual thing, but what is there anything you want to share with us? On what yeah, you know, I, I, yeah, I mean, we, we obviously are going to try to do a couple of things that would uh, be virtual and still keep the spirit uh, of, you know, I, I would say kind of the joy and the frivolity that everybody has. But I also feel it's, it's critical for us to take on a slightly different tone this year. And I, and I hope Alum will take that charge seriously. Um, we are in an election cycle. Um, you know, one of our alums has the opportunity to uh, go to the White House. And I think that we have a very, very sacred obligation uh, to make sure that we understand the issues at hand and that we are very clear about why going to the ballot box is important. And so what we am planning to do over the course of that week is to uh, present to the alum uh, from protest to policy. Uh, to really speak to the issues, to have some really engaged um, presentations, uh, to really kind of crystallize a lot of what we've been through as a country over the past six to eight months, and to really bring it home for our alum in a way that post homecoming, they can go out and mobilize and do the right things. And I, I hope that I, I know what homecoming means to people. And I know that that equates partying with a lot of folks. Uh, but we're in a very, very serious moment in our country. And I think if we really love our university, as I believe we do, uh, I think this is a very important opportunity for us to educate each other about the issues and for us to really mobilize um, around those issues and go to the ballot box. Not suggesting how people should vote, but suggesting that people should empower themselves and their community um, with uh, information and knowledge that makes them a much better citizen uh, between October and November 3rd, if nothing else. Right, right. 
Well, I want to thank you. I want to take, be, be, before, sorry, before you wrap up, I want to take one privilege, and that is it'd be remiss since it's the first time we're getting together as alum if I didn't do this. And I, I would love for us to take a moment of silence for Chadwick Boseman. Um, he became somebody that I, I, I consider a friend uh, when I had him come to speak uh, at commencement. It was for a reason. As I was bringing back the College of Fine Arts, I approached him. Um, I knew that he was part of the protest about that. And I told him, I think, like everything else we wanted to in protest the policy, we want to make sure that we don't become frivolous about just protesting for the sake of protesting. And he had agreed uh, to be on the Board of Visitors for the new College of Fine Arts. Uh, he had agreed to he start a scholarship um, for the College, College of Fine Arts. And those are things that I think uh, really speak to who he was as an alum. Always engaged. I had signed a deal with him to start a master class uh, that uh, he would bring uh, key people in the industry to come and uh, present to the students. And that was something that we intended uh, and we still intend to do. And we're going to try to make a significant production out of it. So, uh, you know, I think it would be, it would mean a lot to me uh, for us to just take a moment of silence on his behalf. All right, thank you, Charlie. I appreciate uh, it. I will be remiss if I did not bring to uh, mention the endowment also to of our alum of uh, Camilla Forbes, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, and Susan Kalechi Watsons and their million dollar endowment of, of what they did because it's doing, raising money differently, as I call it, doing things differently as alum that we can get together and, and, and add value to the university and make sure that we give back to. So I love what they did <clears throat> on putting together that endowment. And so I speak this and I, this is the call to action to all alum out there. If you have ideas and ways that you think that you can partner either with your corporation or with your fellow alum, and you want to think about raising money for the institution, uh, definitely bring them to me uh, and we will definitely work with the university to see them through. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. So thank you for your time. I hope to see you in December <laughs> so we can update everybody. Uh, hopefully we have a proud moment after November and we can update everybody going into January, into spring and what's going on there. So until next time, Dr. Frederick, I appreciate your time. Um, thank you. Appreciate it. Right. Thank uh. you. <laughs> <laughs>